Dear brothers and sisters, good morning. Good morning. What a pleasure it is to be able to share God's word with you all this morning, especially as our world continues to face this coronavirus. For us to be able to gather and worship our Lord together is truly an act of God's amazing grace. If we ever took for granted being able to gather together in one space, all together, and worship our Lord. I believe that we now know that this is all the unmerited favor of our God. Let me take a moment first to uh, share a little bit about myself. Um, I was actually born across the street at McKay Hospital. But actually, before I was a year old, my parents uh, immigrated to the United States. Uh, We first lived in Iowa. And then when I was two years old, we moved to Illinois. And then when I was about five years old, we moved to Southern California. And I lived in Southern California for about 30 years. So I pretty much grew up in Southern California. Getting a college and graduate degree in psychology, uh, working as a statistician at UCLA doing HIV AIDS research, and then as a project manager and management consultant at Kaiser Permanente, which is a hospital system in California. Everything was great. Uh, living the American dream that I think my parents had hoped for when they decided to immigrate from Taiwan to the United States. Job-wise, I was working myself up the career ladder. Family-wise, had a beautiful wife and two young children. Faith-wise, was very involved in church and also very involved in our church small group. However, 10 years ago, in 2010, while I was on a missions trip in Bangkok, Thailand, God placed a burden in my heart to return to the country of my birth to Taiwan. And after much prayer and consideration, my wife, uh, who had moved to the US when she was 13, along with our two young children, my son who was seven years old and my daughter was four years old, uh, we decided to move back to Taiwan in the summer of 2011. It has been an amazing nine year journey, including time both serving and working in Taipei, as well as my family's hometown in Jiayi. Last year, I graduated with a Master of Divinity degree from Taiwan Theological College and Seminary. And I currently work at the seminary as a pastor in the school's Office of Student Affairs. Um, My main work is to take care of our students, uh, making sure that if they ever, uh, through their studies or through their internships, ever uh, face any difficulties, uh, there's always someone that they can come to and I can pray for them. Um, I also spend time reading the word with them Uh, worshiping together with them, and giving them a time at seminary while they're preparing for future ministry to really experience that relationship with God. Uh, So my goal and my purpose at the uh, seminary is to uh, share God's love and his care with these students, knowing that before they graduate and go to church to serve, that they can first experience God's love themselves. So that when they go to church and to serve, they can then share that experience with brothers and sisters in Christ. So this nine-year journey is a testimony of God's amazing grace. Uh, From my wife's parents coming to know Christ six years ago, so they came to know Christ after we had moved back from Taiwan, to the birth of our third child, who is now seven years old, to the discovery of my family roots in Jiayi, and my family's history with the Presbyterian Church in Taiwan, to be able to respond to God's call and graduate from seminary. This has given me even greater conviction that the God we worship is the God of the Bible and the God of the universe. I share this with you all prior to my message so that you can begin to get to know me and my faith journey. But more importantly, this is a testimony of my faith. This is not only my own personal testimony, but it is also the testimony of the Church of Jesus Christ Ours is a testimony and witness of the love of God working through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we can gather together this morning. This is all your amazing grace. We thank you that we can study your word together and through your word be encouraged, be inspired, and to learn how we as a church should continue to worship together in unity. You call us all together with different backgrounds from different places, using different languages, but we all gather together because of Jesus Christ. So may the Holy Spirit lead us this morning. 
giving us a spirit of wisdom, helping us to understand your word and apply it to our lives. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it is the Holy Spirit that Jesus in the book of Acts promised would descend upon his disciples, giving them power to be his witness to the world. We as the Church of Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, are Jesus' witness to the world. In the book of Acts, Jesus' disciples, who have been with him for the past three years during his earthly ministry, need to come grips with the fact that their teacher is no longer with them. In the past, all they needed to do was do what Jesus did, do what Jesus told them to do. But now they have to figure out on their own, without Jesus standing beside them, how to continue the ministry that Jesus has started and imparted on them. The question is how? How will the disciples know what to do and what to say? In the first chapter of the book of Acts, Jesus tells his disciples, in verses 4 and 5, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift from my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then regarding this Holy Spirit, in verse 8, Jesus tells his disciples, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So Acts chapter 1, verse 8 is a very important verse because the entire book of Acts is a testimony of how the gospel spread from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. It also answers our question of how the disciples were able to continue Jesus' ministry without him on earth leading them. After Jesus ascended into heaven, his disciples received power from the Holy Spirit. The gospel of Jesus Christ began to spread as his disciples served as his witness from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. In the book of Acts, we see Jesus' disciples receive power from the Holy Spirit. This power has a purpose. The purpose is so that they can testify and be a witness for Jesus Christ. Power of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts is directly related to evangelism, or sharing the gospel, both in action and in word. So this is a good reminder to us when we say we are sharing our testimony. We often have a lot of opportunities to share our testimony, how we came to know Christ, how Christ has worked in our lives, how through Bible reading, how through prayer, God has answered us. But this testimony is not only through our words, but it's also through our actions. It is this witness in both word and action that is the power of the Holy Spirit. As we saw in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, this witness of Jesus Christ is to begin in Jerusalem and then spread from Jerusalem to all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So in the book of Acts, starting from Acts chapter 2, at the Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descended on those gathered in Jerusalem, giving them power to speak in the mother language or the mother tongue of those Jews returning to Jerusalem from the Greek world. So Jews that were spread out in different areas, they spoke different dialects, but they all gathered back in Jerusalem to worship God because that's where uh, the temple was. So they all spoke different dialects. And then when the Holy Spirit descended on those apostles, on those disciples, they all of a sudden were able to speak in different dialects so that those Greeks, Greek Jews that returned to Jerusalem were able to understand the gospel. It is here that the gospel began to spread first in Jerusalem and then out to Judea and Samaria, to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews, and then to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth in the book of Acts most likely refers to Rome, where the book of Acts ends and then transitions to the book of Romans. However, as the gospel spread from Jerusalem to the Greek world, a problem began to arise. The Jews that came to know Christ and accepted him as their Lord and Savior now had to learn how to interact and worship together with the Gentiles. The problem being Jews as the chosen people of God had been taught that they were made clean because of their relationship with God and because of their law, while the Gentiles as foreigners were unclean. In the past, the separation between the Jews and the Gentiles was clear-cut because it was not based only on the religious traditions and their forefathers, but also because of their race and ethnicity. As the Jews and Gentiles both began to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the issue of who is our brother and sister no longer was a question of race and ethnicity, 
but of belief and unbelief. Those that believed and followed after Jesus were to be united as the church. However, for the Jews, this required them to redefine who was considered clean and unclean. And the re requirements for defining who was considered us and who was considered them. So the Jews, with their ancestral traditions, their law, or their relationship and agreement, promise with God, now needed to figure out how they were able to become, become one with a group that didn't live under the traditions, that didn't live under their law or their covenant, and thus in their eyes were seen as unclean. So with, with, with this ongoing tension in our minds, let's look at Acts chapter 15, because our verse, uh, verses 7 through 11 actually is in the middle of this uh, chapter. But let's start from verse 1. In Acts chapter 15, verse 1, Scripture says, Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. So the gospel, as Jesus told his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, had now spread from Jerusalem to the Gentiles in Antioch. Certain people, those Jews that now believed and followed after Jesus, came to teach the Gentiles that ne needed to be circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses. So according to the Jews, the Gentiles needed to be circumcised in order to be saved. For those Jews, salvation wasn't just about believing in Jesus Christ, but about conversion into the Jewish religion. As I previously shared, the Jews probably thought that this was the only way that they can be united with the Gentiles as followers of Christ. To them, belief or unbelief wasn't the issue, but whether or not the Gentiles that were racially and ethnically non-Jews could, under Jewish law and customs, be considered clean and thus could worship together with them. These Jewish believers em emphasized that circumcision was needed beyond faith of Christ to be saved. Because for the Jews, circumcision was required by God as a sign of his covenant and promise with his chosen people. In verse 2, scripture says that this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. So let's backtrack a little bit. In Acts chapter 11, news reached the church in Jerusalem that a great number of Greeks in Antioch believed and turned to the Lord. So the church in Jerusalem then sent people to Antioch to see if this was indeed true. Can the Gentiles really believe in Jesus as we do? So they sent Barnabas to Antioch to confirm that the gospel had indeed spread to the Gentiles in Antioch. And who is Barnabas? Barnabas actually first appears in the book of Acts chapter 4. In chapter 4, 36 and 37, scripture says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So when Barnabas saw that the believers in Jerusalem sharing their possessions for the needy among them, he was also touched and sold a field that he owned and gave the proceeds to the apostles to help those in need. So Barnabas originally lived in Cyprus where he grew up and he came back to Jerusalem to worship there. And he was so touched by what he saw there that he also came to know Jesus Christ. So Barnabas was sent to Antioch and when he was sent to Antioch, he saw that the grace of God was on the Gentile believers there. And he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. In, chapter, uh, in verse 2 that we actually read, we saw both Paul and Bar Barnabas appear in this verse. So who is Paul? Paul we also know by his other name as Saul. So Saul is his Hebrew name and Paul is his Greek name. So we know that in the Bible, a lot of times people have both Greek and Hebrew names. So the Jews have their Hebrew name, the, birth, the name of their birth, and also their Greek name uh, because they lived among the Greek people. Uh, for example, I have my English name, Michael, and I also have my birth name, my Chinese name. So we know from the book of Philippians that Paul, which is his Greek name, was a Pharisee or Jewish leader. And from the book of Acts, chapter 9, it is noticed that Paul, previously known as Saul, his Hebrew name, was zealously persecuting the Lord's disciples. However, on the road to Damascus, Paul was blinded by a flashing light, and a voice of Jesus came to him, asking why he was persecuting him. 
So in the book of Acts chapter 9, we see Paul's conversion from persecuting the church to one that preached to the Jews that Jesus is the Son of God. So Barnabas initially met Paul in Jerusalem. And then when Paul went to Antioch, when Barnabas went to Antioch to confirm that the Gentiles were indeed believers now and turned to the Lord, he went to Tarsus to look for Paul. Because Paul eventually went back to his hometown of Tarsus. So Barnabas brought Paul back with him to Antioch. And for a full year, Paul and Barnabas taught the church there in Antioch. The Antioch church also, through direction of the Holy Spirit, eventually sent Paul and Barnabas as missionaries. So Paul and Barnabas went as missionaries to the Greek world and continued to spread the gospel. So in chapter, Acts chapter 15, verse 2, where we see Paul and Barnabas again appear, this is after they already went out as missionaries and then came back to Antioch and were sharing with the church in Antioch how the Gentiles began to believe in Jesus Christ. It is here that we see this conflict with Jews coming down from Judea to tell the Gentiles that they need to be circumcised in order to believe and in order to be saved. And it's here that this conflict occurs. Because Paul and Barnabas had just experienced on their missionary journey, they saw that the Holy Spirit came upon the Gentiles and that the Gentiles were able to believe in Jesus Christ. So in, ver in chap chapter 15, verse 3, the church sent them, which is Paul and Barnabas, along with other believers from Antioch. And as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, the leaders of the Jews, stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. So the church in Antioch sent Paul and Barnabas along with some of their own congregation to pre present this problem to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. On their journey to Jerusalem, we see Paul and Barnabas continue to share about how the Gentiles have been converted on their first missionary journey. While in Jerusalem, Paul and Barnabas, along with others in their party, are welcomed by the church, the apostles, the elders, and report everything God had done through them. However, some of the believers who belonged to the Pharisee party stood up and said that the Gentiles needed to be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. So in verse 1, those that came down from Judea to Antioch were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. The Pharisees in Jerusalem not only taught that the Gentiles needed to be circumcised, but that they also were required to keep the law of Moses. In essence, what we see here is the Jews basically saying that the Gentiles needed to live up to the standards established by the Jewish forefathers, just as they had to. Basically, what they were saying was that the Gentiles needed to become Jewish. Now we approach our verse for today, uh, verses 7 through 11. So after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. This is what Peter said. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Verse 8. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. Okay, so who is Peter? Peter was a fisherman, a Jewish fisherman. And we also know him, know him as Simon, who along with his brother Andrew were the first disciples that Jesus called to follow after him. We also know Peter as the one that denied Jesus three times after Jesus was arrested. We also know Peter as the one that Jesus reinstated after his resurrection, asking him three times, do you love me? We often talk about Paul as the one bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. Dr. Peter in, the Acts, in Acts chapter 10 also has his own experience with Gentile believers. In Acts chapter 10, while in prayer, Peter had a vision. This is his vision. Saul had been opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. 
Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. So after Peter had this vision, three men who were sent by him in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion, came to ask for Peter. So it happened that Cornelius had had been visited by an angel of God and was told to go look for Peter. And since Peter had just had the vision regarding God, declaring that what was once seen as unclean as clean, he knew that God was telling him that he can now associate with the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 10, verse 28, he says this, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. And while Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit came upon all who heard this message as a sign of acceptance. And Cornelius, a Gentile, and his entire household were baptized that day. So in chapter 10, verse 47 and 48, Peter says, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So this is Peter's experience with the Gentile. And Peter, now being an elder of the church in Jerusalem, having this own experience, he then stood up. And in verses 8 through 11 that we, recently, we just saw, let me go back to that. He says, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Verse 10. Now then, why do we try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. So God knows the heart. It's the heart that needs to be purified, not the outward customs or traditions, but the heart by faith. Peter said God did not discriminate between us and them. Even though these Jews and these Pharisees are trying to figure out a way how to get these Gentiles to become like them, Peter says God doesn't look at our traditions, our customs, but he looks at the heart. Regarding the requirement for Gentiles to be circumcised and follow after the law of Moses, Peter questions the Jews and asks them why they are testing God. Because God already declared the Gentiles clean by faith. Why are the Jews testing God by making the Gentiles follow after the law of Moses, which even the Jews nor their ancestors could live up to? Peter concludes that it is through the grace of the Lord Jesus that the Jews are saved. It is also through the grace of the Lord Jesus, the same grace that saves the Gentiles. So salvation is through the grace of Jesus, through a purification of a believer's heart by faith. Based on Peter's own experience, there is no longer us and them. There is only us. There is only one, saved by Jesus. There is the church. The question then is not how one can be saved, Because it is clear, salvation is through the grace of Jesus, through a purification of the believer's heart by faith. We are saved because our hearts have been purified by faith through the grace of Jesus Christ, dying for our sins on the cross. Although the question of salvation has already been taken care of, there still is an issue of life after salvation. The question of how the Jews and the Gentiles were to live and worship together as the church of Christ. Peter had already established the requirements for salvation. Next, the brother of Jesus, James, stood up, and he represented the elders of the church. So Peter represented the apostles, James represented the elders. And he proposed a compromise based on Holy Scripture, based on the book of Leviticus, chapters 17 and 18. Here it provides instructions for Israelites and how they are to live with foreigners among them. So in... uh, Today's chapter, chapter 15, verses uh, 19 through 21, Scripture says this. This is James, the brother of Jesus, speaking. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, 
from the meat strangled, of strangled animals and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. So verses 19 through 21 is a summary of some of the main points from Leviticus chapter 17 and 18. And James says, let's require the Gentiles to live by these standards, not by whether or not they're circumcised or uncircumcised, as a compromise for how the Jews now can get along with the Gentiles. So rather than needing to convert to the Jewish religion to be saved, James suggested that the Gentiles agree to live by certain standard that the Jews had as a way to avoid conflict and to live together in peace and unity. According to biblical scholar Charles Talbert, the Gentile messianists are to behave in this way not because the law says so, but because it is a minimum that will allow Jews who observe the law to associate with the Gentiles who do not. And according to scripture, those in Antioch, the Gentiles, the believers in Jesus Christ that read the letter rejoiced at its encouraging message. So they, know, they knew that they didn't have to convert to the Jewish religion. They just needed to compromise and live in some of the ways, some of the habits that the Jews had, and that then they could then worship together, Jews and Gentiles alike, as the Church of Jesus Christ. In the book of Ephesians, Paul also talks about circumcision. Showing that through Jesus' blood, all believers are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. So let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 19. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and call uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in G Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. So this is speaking about the Jews and the Gentiles, thus making peace. And in one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. And the body, meaning the body of Christ, meaning the church. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. So the issue is not whether we're Jewish or non-Jewish. It's not a question of ethnicity, but it's a question of if we believe in Jesus Christ. It's a belief or unbelief question. And if we believe, no matter what our background is, we're all members of one body through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. So salvation is not a matter of tradition, culture, language, but by faith through the grace of our Lord Jesus. The question is how once we are saved do we learn to live together in unity? as members of God's household. How do we live together in unity, in community, giving, the, giving that we are made up of people with different backgrounds and experiences? How do we not let church tradition and culture dictate who we accept and who we reject? How do we welcome both believers and non-believers with open arms, embracing them with the love of God, rather than setting up obstacles and hurdles that push people away? We first need clear a clear biblical goal to work towards in order to have unity as the body of Christ. So let's look at John chapter 13, 34 and 35. This is uh, the last scripture that we're going to look at today. Here, Jesus gives his disciples a new command. This new command can serve as our reminder of how we work together to move towards church unity. Here, Jesus tells his disciples, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Here, Jesus reminds his disciples, and he reminds us as well, that we need to love one another. But if we think about it, is loving one another something difficult or is it simple? I think loving one another is something that's very difficult. Actually, let's think first about loving someone. Do we find it hard sometimes to love others? 
I think loving others is difficult enough. But at least loving others is something that we have control over. For example, I can decide to love you all today. Whether or not you want me to love you or not, whether or not you love me back, I can decide on my own to love you. And I can, after we uh, finish our service, I can go and buy everyone senzu nai cha. And everyone would be very happy. Even if some of you don't like me and reject me, I can choose on my own to love you. But loving one another is difficult, even more difficult. I would even say it's impossible without the Holy Spirit because the love of God needs to be in all of our hearts. So I can choose to love you, but I can't control if you love me. I can love you, but I can't control or dictate if you love me back. So loving one another is very difficult because I can only be responsible half, for half of the equation. I can choose to love you. And like I just said, sometimes even loving someone is hard enough. But whether or not you love me back, whether or not you accept me, whether or not we can worship together, whether or not we can fellowship together, whether or not we can enjoy a meal together, is something I can't control. So loving one another, why, why do we think Jesus actually says in verse 35, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Why would everyone know that we're his disciples if we love one another? It means that loving one another is something that is unique. It's unique so that when we show as a church that we love one another, that people outside of the church will know that we are Jesus' disciples. That's how unique it is. That's how difficult it is. But I think that's the higher goal that we have. That's the higher purpose we have as a church. So even though the Jews and the Gentiles said, okay, we'll live by these Jewish traditions, but I hope that our church today has even higher goals than that. Let's not only think about how do I live by your traditions, live by your culture, live by your language, but how do we move beyond that and work as a church towards loving one another? Perhaps the best reminder for us this morning is to take a look at the following statement that is displayed on our own EM's website. Why don't we read this together it's in the Who We Are section. While we are a community Together, let's read this together. While we are a community in the Presbyterian denomination, we are incredibly proud of our broadness. The diverse faith experiences of our members mean that we welcome people from all Christian denominations and backgrounds. In this way, we really try to reflect the wonderful richness of the global Christian tradition and to practice the hospitality of Christ, who opens up his arms to welcome all people and who shows no favoritism. We also welcome a large number of non-Christian seekers and give them the space and freedom they need to learn more about God at their own speed. At the EM, there really is a place for everyone. So as a church and a community of believers, we first must be clear that salvation is not a matter of the way we worship, but a matter of our faith, our belief, and our trust in Jesus Christ. Salvation is grace, by the grace of Jesus, through a purification of a believer's heart by faith. However, as we go from salvation to seek after church unity, we must all learn, whether we've been in this church since we've been a child or we just recently came, how we worship together in unity. For the Jews and for the purpose of unity, the Gentiles agreed to honor certain Jewish traditions. And this required the Jews to be clear and communicate what was important to them. And for the Gentiles to understand and also be willing to compromise and accept and honor these traditions. However, for our REM, it is my prayer that we will reach a higher standard of love and unity that goes beyond tradition and culture, but that reaches the standard that Jesus set for his disciples to love one another. I'm not saying tradition and culture aren't important, because in tradition and culture define who we are. It helps us to understand our own history, our own heritage. But rather, let's not let these things be a hindrance for reaching the higher goal of loving one another in Christ as a unified church. So may the Lord give us a spirit of wisdom as we learn how to live together as a Christian community, celebrating our differences in a spirit of unity. Celebrating our differences in a spirit of unity. May the Holy Spirit help us to learn to love one another as an act of our unity so that everyone will know that we are Jesus' disciples and so that all will know that at the EM, there really is a place for everyone. How? by the power of the Holy Spirit, and as a witness of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you this morning. Through your word, we see the Jews and the Gentiles trying to figure out and understand how being believers in Jesus Christ, they can now worship 
as a church together. 2,000 plus years later, we as a church, we as the EM, are still trying to figure out how we live and worship together with people from different backgrounds, from people with different customs, traditions, even different languages. So I pray that this morning we continue to consider how we live together in unity, in our diverseness, in our differences, how do we live together in unity. So may your Holy Spirit shine your light upon us, giving us a spirit of wisdom, helping us to see it's okay that we're different. We don't have to be exactly the same. It's okay that we worship differently. We don't have to be, have to be exactly the same. It's okay that we use different languages to worship. We don't have to be exactly the same. But in Jesus Christ, as our head, and as one church, in our differences, may you help us to figure out, may you help us to see how we are to be united. And through loving one another, may those that come into this church, and may those that know us, know that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.